I pray for your saints that you bless them. Thank you for the ones who were out here this evening. Lord, for all the prayer requests, to all the ones tonight that aren't feeling well, I pray that you pick them up, help them, Lord, help them to feel better, touch them. I pray that, uh, that you just uh, bless the prayer requests, bless the kids in Sunday school. I pray everything that is done tonight would be done to the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. Okay, uh, I've been really impressed lately just with the sheer <clears throat> load of prayers that the saints have been praying. I have never, uh, I have, I guess, in the past seen our church pray, but lately, just due to all the things that are happening uh, with some of the church members and people requesting prayer, I can, I can just tell that everybody is praying really, really hard and everybody is in fervent prayer and they're remembering one another in prayer. And to me, that's very, very important for a church. And that's one of those things that when you think about church, you know that if you ask somebody to pray for you, they're going to lift you up in prayer. They're going to keep you in, in their prayers. That is part of the fellowship that we have one with another. You know, you might not be a, a person of many words. You might shake people's hands and, and try to encourage them, but you might not always be active with them. You know, some people are limited in the amount of fellowship they can actually have with someone. But one thing that people do is they keep others in prayer. And to me, that is a spiritual fellowship that so many people neglect as Christians. And just exercising prayer for one another is a way to keep a fellowship and keep closeness together. And, and tonight I'm going to talk about that a little bit. That's, that's a supportive network that we have. You know, you think about people in this world. They can go talk to a counselor. They can pay them money. They may have a friend that listens to them. But they, for support, who do they go to? Do they have to join a support group? Do they have to find a club to, to be a part of? You know, with us, we don't need support groups. We really don't. We have all the support we need right here. And people that don't go to church are cheated because they don't have someone that says in truthfulness and, and just in sincerity and honesty, hey, I care about you and I want to pray for you. And when somebody exercises that to you, how much that means to you. And I know it means a lot to me when people say, Pastor, you know, lately I or whatever. I've seen you've been going through some tough times, or I, I noticed that lately something seems to be bothering you or something. I'm not saying it is right now, but when somebody says, I've been praying for you, how much that means to me. And I know it means a lot to you, doesn't it? That, that supportive network of prayer. You know, everyone needs a good friend. Even God did. And I mentioned this, and this is kind of like uh, tailored to a message I, have pre I preached maybe about a month and a half ago. But I want to use two verses that I used there in that to begin that message. But let's go to Psalm 133 in James chapter 2. Psalm chapter 133. Psalm 133 in James chapter 2. Psalm 133, verse 2, and James chapter 2. Psalm 133, verse 2, let's look at verse number 1. Behold how good and how pleasant it is. And again, I just used this in a sermon recently. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. And that is so important for a church. It's so important for the brethren. Unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Unity in prayer. Unity in support for one another. What is it like when people dwell together in unity? It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments, as the dew of Hermon, as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. So when God saw that precious ointment that ran down upon Aaron's head, 
and went down upon his beard and ran down his beard, down his skirts of his garments. God was so pleased and so glorified by that that he it it made him smile. It made him inside. It gave him glory and honor, and it gave him a good feeling inside. And God has feelings. God has feelings. And when he sees brethren dwelling together in unity, <clears throat> God remembers that same thing. Now imagine that. When a church and saints are uplifting one another and praying for one another, sending cards to one another, sending text messages to one another, phone calls, words of encouragement, maybe a knock on the door. Hey, how you been? We've been praying for you. What does God think of that? God says, that's like that time that that oil ran down upon that priest, ran down upon Aaron. And God says that to him is like the dew upon the mountains. When God looks down and sees that beautiful thing, that gives him a great feeling and that brings honor to him. <clears throat> now, God made a covenant with a man and that covenant would be an everlasting covenant. And he did that. And I know the world struggles with this. <clears throat> when you think about the world, you spin a globe and you take your finger, the very tip of your finger is probably about the size of it. And you take your finger and you touch <clears throat> one particular area what area would that be? Not the equator. If I spun the globe and I was God and I said, my land. What would God put his finger on? He would put his finger on Israel. He would put his finger on his land. He would put his finger on his people. Now, people say, but the world's big. There's a lot of land. There's a lot of nations. Do you know in the Bible that Israel is not reckoned among the nations? Israel is all together by itself. When God thinks of the nations, and today, you could apply it today, God says in his word, Israel is not reckoned among the nations, which means America, yeah, you might be great. England might be a great nation. China, Russia. Japan, great nations, continents, Africa with all those wild animals and all that beauty there, Mount Kilimanjaro and South Africa and all the beauty of Africa and all the wildness of it. And Asia, the mass. I told my wife, I said, really no other continent like Asia. This, the, the severe heat as well as the severe cold. And all of the rich minerals and everything that are in that continent, how big it is, and how many people live there. And then you think about Europe, and you think about civilization for the most part, and how there in Europe, the world kind of got its start with Christianity, and that went to the ends of the world, huh? And then maybe you think about North America, South America, and that world's largest island. Australia, down the land down under, and you think the beauty and the wildness of that particular place. But God reckons those as nations and continents. But one land, he says, this particular area is not reckoned among the nations. It's different. It's the place that God put his, he put his hand on. It's the place that God put his energies into. It's the place that God made a covenant with. He made a covenant all because of one particular man. And that man befriended God. Now, I didn't go to the passage last time, but I will this time so you know where it is. Anybody know where Abraham is called the friend of God? Anybody know the book? It's easy to say Genesis, right? Because that has so much about the life of Abraham, but it's not Genesis. Where Abraham was called the friend of God is actually in the New Testament. So it's in the book of James. It's in the book of James. James chapter 2. James chapter 2. <clears throat> there was just something about Abraham that God kind of, he just liked this guy. 
you know, and there are certain men in the Bible and women in the Bible that just stand out above others. They just had a heart for God. Who else did God just seem to prefer? Who? David. God seemed to prefer David. He preferred David above all the kings, didn't he? Josiah was a great king. Hezekiah was a great king. Uh, some of the others. Asa was a great king. Um, Solomon, great king. But who did God prefer? And why did he prefer him? You see, sometimes I think, and I do, I do a lot of thinking, and I think about Christians. And sometimes I, it's a wonder of my world why some Christians don't serve God. I, I wonder that. I always wonder. Who, who, who wonders that? Or just wonder, why don't you serve God? Don't you realize the blessings that you're not getting because you don't serve God? You know people now that are saved, and you know they're saved, but they just don't serve God. And then you have some that are in and some that are out. Some that are cold. Some that are lukewarm. They're sometimes in and they're sometimes out. And then you have some that are always in and always hot and always excited for God. And no matter what happens in their life, it just seems that you look and you say, they are just like the rock of Gibraltar. Steady. You know people like that? And you look at them and you say, no matter what, as the saying is, come hell or high water. That person will serve God until the day they die. And if they don't, I'll be shocked. Why is it that some have a heart for God and others don't. But you look at the Bible and you see some people, they were, they were great for God, but yet God's emotion was uncertain in the scriptures more than others. Would you agree with me? Name me another one. God's, God's heart was with this man. Oh, he walked with God. But who else? And maybe he wasn't as deserving as some of the others. Jacob. Jacob. And I know I, I always uh, I always smile. And I know some others do too. Because when I say Jacob, he's one of those people in the Bible that I really like. Because a lot of myself I see in him. And my dad always reminded me of that when I was younger. But Abraham. What was unique about him? Who else found grace in the eyes of the Lord? <clears throat> Noah. Noah, just one day. And there's a curious verse in the book of Genesis. I read it the other day, and I read it to my wife, and I said, I don't know what it is about this verse, but it's got something in it. In fact, let's read this, and then we'll go over there. I didn't have my notes, but I want to just show it to you, because I want you to think about it, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to research it a little bit more. But James chapter 2, and verse uh, 21, 21, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac, his son, upon the altar? Now, when, you, when I say Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, would you say they were all three blessed? Would you? Abraham blessed, was he? Did he have a heart for God? Yes. He was called the friend of God, okay? And it says here, it says, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by works was faith made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. Now, would you say yourself? that you were a friend of God? Can God rely on you like a friend would? You know, you say, well, what, what's a friend? A friend is somebody that you can count on. The Bible says there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And sometimes friends do. And they're there all the way through and say, this person has been my friend. And they will always be my friend. And I love that person for being my friend. Abraham was God's friend. But think of this, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. 
God was the friend of Abraham. Isaac, when you study his life, you see that Isaac kind of Isaac kind of fell away from the Lord a little bit and wasn't as blessed up to the level of the other ones. And when you see the life of Isaac, you see that, yeah, he was blessed, but not like Abraham and not like Jacob. And Jacob, of course, had a wrestling match with God. And through that wrestling match, God touched him. And that shows affliction. And sometimes through affliction, God, that relationship with God can get deeper. And that's where Christians struggle sometimes too, with affliction. But affliction sometimes brings us brings us closer to the Lord. Um, so let's go over to that verse in Genesis, where I want to read this to you. It's uh, over there in Genesis chapter five, five or chapter six. <clears throat> Uh, it's in Genesis chapter five, Genesis chapter five. I find this to be a really curious verse, and I, I don't know exactly what the meaning of it is or when it was fulfilled. But if we look in Genesis chapter five, this is the list of names, and these people lived a really long time. Uh, how long did Methuselah live? 969 years. How long did Adam live? Nine hundred and nine hundred and thirty years Adam lived, and Jared was in there. That list of five, you know, those they lived a long time. They all lived over nine hundred years. So, you get through that list, and then all of a sudden, and this is before the flood. There's a man who's born, and his name is Noah. Now, if you go over, let's look in chapter five, verse twenty-eight. The scripture says, now you got in 27, Methuselah, and all the days of Methuselah were 960 and nine years, and he died. So nobody makes it to a thousand years in the Bible. Do you ever wonder why? Ever wonder why God, you get to 969, it's like, come on, Lord, let me get to a thousand, right? I mean, in all of that, you're only how many years away? 31 years. Come on, Lord, in the grand scheme of things. Give me 31 more so I can say I made it to a thousand, but the Lord wouldn't let him. And there's a reason for that. Because no one outlived a whole day. A day is as a thousand years unto the Lord, and a thousand years is as one day. Nobody lived more than one day. And it's prophetic because the millennial rest is God's day, and that day is a thousand years, and we're going to see the same thing begin to happen in the millennium, where people are going to live. Do you need a drink of water? Okay. Where people are going to live up to a thousand years again. Okay. So here's here's the verse. It says, twenty eight, and Lamech lived one hundred eighty and two years and begat a son. So in his hundred and eighty second year. And he called his name Noah. Look what's said here. Now, again, this is before the flood. Saying, this same shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. Okay, now, what happened in the days of Noah? Noah was born, and the saying was here. This same shall comfort us. The question here is, how was he going to comfort them? Didn't the flood come with Noah? How could the flood be a comfort? What was the comfort? There's a lot to this verse. Now, you could think of this and say that maybe people got tired of living. They lived so long that all they did their whole life was work. And think about this in your lifespan, as we say 70 or 80 years, you work, 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 and say you go to work for 40 years. After 40 years of working, what do you get? You get tired, don't you? Now imagine working from the time you're 20 till the time you're 969. Because you say, well, they could have gone on cruise control. 
Was there any retirement plans back here? What did they have to do every day? Work. They had to work. So when Noah comes, the saying is, this man's going to comfort us concerning our toil and our work. Now, was it, and this, these are just some thoughts, was it that the flood was going to come and God was going to cause man to not live to a thousand anymore, but he was going to shrink his lifespan down and people knew it? Was it because God was going to destroy the earth and he was going to start anew? Or was it because, as the Bible says, that the flood came because of violence? Okay. Was the earth so bad, as we know, God destroyed it, that everyone was looking for the destruction to come? Because the earth was corrupt. Now, that's something I've been reading and looking at. I'm going to have more on that. But there's something to all of this. And it has, it has to deal with something as far as the promise given to Noah. God was going to start again with him. But I thought that verse was pretty neat. But God looked down from heaven. And Noah's one of those people that just like Abraham. God looked at Noah. And the Bible says that Noah found grace. In the eyes of the Lord. Okay. Found grace. Okay. So tonight, friendship and fellowship, and that with the brethren, the fellowship of the saints. Let's go to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Let's look at verse number one. Paul, Paul made sure that the saints were fellowshipping with, with each other and that they were ministering to one another and how important it is. And again, through all the prayers, and I know everyone appreciates the prayers, uh, all the prayers that went up for Lily, everybody is very thankful for those prayers. I just marveled how many people were praying. And, you know, you think about this, God has to, when he hears all of those prayers, God has to listen to those. And they have to move him. And I just think if we can just keep on praying like that, we will move God. And God's pleased. Because there's something about prayer. God wants to be bothered. You know, people don't always want to be bothered. But God wants to be. He wants us to bother him. He wants us to talk to him. He wants us to confide in him. He wants us to go to him with our needs. He doesn't get overwhelmed. The average person would. But he even says, the more you do it, the more likely you are to get the prayer answered. And that's part of fellowshipping and ministering. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we do, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. How that in a great trial of affliction, and I'd say that some people tonight are going through some great trials of affliction. Uh, over the years, our church has suffered through some great trials. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For the, to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves See, sometimes in fellowship and sometimes being a servant or a minister or a servant to others, it takes you to give of yourself, to be unselfish. And that's one thing when you pray for somebody else, you're giving of your time, you're giving of your strength, you're not being selfish, you're praying for others. They were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we, we would receive the gift. And take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. So there's a fellowship in the ministering. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first, see, first gave their own selves to the Lord. So here's the thing. You want to get prayers answered, you have to give yourself to God first. Be unselfish and give yourself to God. 
And when you do that and you're sold out to the service of God, God is more likely to hear the prayers that you bring up. This is why often people will seek out somebody who's faithful to church. And they'll say, hey, would you pray for me? Why do they do that? Because they know that you're faithful and they can see it. And they know that you have such a closeness to God that perhaps God will answer your prayer even before them. You know, there's something to that. That's an unselfish attitude. You take time out and you pray for one another. And I'll tell you, again, I've been pleased. I've been pleased with all of the people that I know are praying for the people of this church and praying for those in need. Praying, praying, praying. And then I hear prayer chains. And then this church is involved in that church and it's spreading all around the country. And we got people out in California and Oregon and other places that are praying. There's a certain spirit in that, a certain fellowship in that, a certain ministration in that. That's important. That's why when somebody asks you to pray, take time out and pray. Don't be somebody that just, okay, I'll pray. You don't pray for the person who asks. It's a part of fellowshipping with them. It's a part of giving of yourself and taking time out. I tell you the other thing, you might even feel to go a bit further in your prayers. I'm not just going to pray, but I'm going to add some supplication with that. I'm going to go ahead and instead of just praying about this, I'm going to go ahead and take time out. And I'm going to what? Fast about this. I'm going to afflict myself. And that's something you don't have to tell anybody. You don't want to disfigure your face and walk around like. <laughs> People say, what's wrong with you? Oh, nothing. You know, you don't want to express that you're fasting. But deep down, you could say, I'm fasting. Lord, I'm going to give of myself so they can get a prayer answer. Fasting will move God. That's another way to minister, minister to other saints. Okay, now fellowship and fellowshipping with each other. And I've seen this happen. When the saints get around each other, like last Wednesday, we had the Keos here. And I could see just with Ed and Dina and the kids when they were here on that Sunday they walked in, there was a certain amount and type of fellowship that day that I was sitting back there where Abby was and I was just listening. And God gave me a break just for a second. I sat down and I just listened. And it sounded like <clears throat> there was 100,000 people in this room. People just talking, laughing, joking, having a great time. And you know what that did for me? That showed me that when the saints fellowship and their sincere fellowship and love towards the brethren, that that excitement and that brings a certain revival to the hearts of people. And that as a pastor makes me feel good because there's always time for revival. And saints always need to be uplifted and they always need revived. And when Ed said he was coming back with the boys and he was coming back on Wednesday, everybody was excited. And then he said, no, he couldn't come. Then all of a sudden, he, I know what he was doing. He wanted to come really badly. <clears throat> he called me and said, well, brother, we're coming. We're going to be there. And when I let everybody know we're going to be there, we got here. And afterwards, we had great fellowship. We had pizza. And everybody just really got uplifted. And it was like one of those things when they were leaving, you said, well, we're not going to see him for a while. And people didn't want to let him go. And his kids didn't want to leave because you could see that they were uplifted and they were revived. That's what happens when people fellowship and people get uplifted. That's all what God wants us to do. You know, he wants us to uplift one another, to go out of our way, to be unselfish in these kind of things. Fellowship revives the saints. It supports them. It gives support. Turn to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 2. We give the right hands of fellowship, just as they did in the Bible. Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 9. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, 
that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. They gave the right hands of fellowship. You know, when we meet each other, what do we do? We put our right hand out there, don't we? And we grab a hold of their hand and we say, hey, brother, how you doing? Hey, sister, how you doing? You know, and sometimes we give that, that hug, right? And as some of the Italians and others, lower Mediterraneans, sometimes they give the kiss of charity too, don't they? You know, hey, how you doing? You know, a kiss on the cheek or something like, been praying for you, been praying for you. You know, it, it's fervency, isn't it? And support. And that does so much when you offer to somebody the right hand of fellowship, been praying for you. Amen. You know, fellowship and support. Um, the fellowship of the brethren. It's, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, the Bible talks of it quite often. First John chapter one, first John chapter one, first John chapter one. First John chapter one. First John chapter one. <clears throat> Let's look in verse number one, first John chapter one, verse one, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. That's what takes it to the next level. The fellowship is just not with the saints. But who's fellowshipping with us? The Holy Spirit, Christ, the Father. They join into the fellowship. So you think about when the saints fellowship together, who's joining them? The Lord's joining them in fellowship. Where two or more are gathered together in my name? What? Where two or more are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So when you're fellowshipping and have a good time, God is right there saying, amen. Praise, praise me, right? <laughs> he wouldn't praise the Lord and say, praise me. And God is blessed. You know, we want to bring a blessing to God and through that fellowship. Now, that fellowship is very, very important. It says in verse number seven, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. So spiritually speaking, we fellowship one with another when we walk together in the light. And I like the end of this. Tommy said in his prayer, we, we claim the blood over everybody here. Think about this. When we're walking in the light and we're fellowshipping in the light, God does something. You ever just walk out of church after fellowshipping and you feel good? Do you ever go over somebody's home and have fellowship and when you leave, you just feel good? Now, you might feel worn out, but your soul feels revived. Something happened. You ever get in one of those church services where just it just seems like God took over? Amen. And you say, wow, that was a real blessing. Amen. What happened? Verse 7 explains it. Verse 7 explains it. You're walking in the light. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. So you walk out and you say, I don't know what it is, but I feel really good. Or you don't want to leave. You know, hey, can we, can we go from the church? Let's, let's go have a cup of coffee. I just don't feel like, I feel like just fellowshipping and and rejoicing with one another. You know, something's happening there. You're walking in the light, and God's in the light, and you're fellowshipping with that other person, and God joins in. And when he joins in, you get revival going. And when you get revival going, you get feeling good. Be not drunk with wine. Why do people drink wine? To get happy. To get happy. That's what they do. I'll go home and drink wine. I'll call me down and I'll get happy. Well, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. 
there's a filling of that spirit that makes you feel like the world does when they get wine in them. See, we don't need that kind of wine. When you got the Holy Spirit, you got all there is. Support and prayers. Let's, let's go to Philippians. That's my last passage. Go to the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter one, Philippians chapter one. There truly is happiness in Christ. There truly is. Hold the amens. Not everybody at once. <laughs> there truly is happiness in Christ. It is. Christians don't take advantage of the fountain. They don't take advantage of the energy that God gives. They don't take advantage of the excitement and the, and the revival that the Holy Spirit can bring. Philippians chapter one, Philippians chapter one says in verse number three, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. <clears throat> every time Paul remembered them, he thanked God for them. Always in every prayer of mine, for you all making requests with joy and your fellowship in the gospel from the first day for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Paul was so thankful for the Philippian church and the Philippians. They uplifted him and he remembered them every day. He gave thanks to God every day for the Philippians. He remembered them in prayer every day in every prayer. It says in verse six, being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you, all because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. For God is my record, how greatly I longed after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. But I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happen unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So even in his bonds, he thanked God because others saw that he was determined. And because of that, they were more bold. So again, as the scripture says, iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friends. And I just praise God that we started out the year with prayer, with, with fellowship, and people, people are considerate and concerned about others in prayer and how important that is as far as fellowshipping one with another. Okay, <clears throat> because it is prayer meeting, I wanted to have something that dealt with prayer tonight. <clears throat>